I'm Mel. It's early in the morning on November 2nd, and this is my October reading wrap-up. I read eight books in October. I did this wrap-up vlog style, um, so I want to try that out and see how that works, see if I like that style. It's definitely a little bit um, more casual and um, more chatty than my September wrap-up. Here are the books that I read in October. So it is mid-October now. I think it's October 17th today. So far in October I have read um, four books. Um, I'm listening to a couple of audiobooks as well. Hopefully I'll be finishing those up soon, but I have read four books. The first book that I read in October was Unnatural Causes by P.D. James. This is one of the Adam Del Gleish series. Um, this is, I can't remember which book this is in the series, maybe the third or the fourth book in the series. It follows, follows Adam Dalgleish as he goes to visit his aunt in the countryside. She lives in a small remote town um, on the seaside that happens to be kind of an enclave for writers. So he's looking forward to quiet days, long walks on the beach, birding with his aunt, and avoiding the writer's community that lives there because, as we all know, Adam Dalgleish is not only a detective, he is a poet as well. He goes for solitude and uh, relaxation and then murder ensues and he's dragged into the investigation of the death of one of the local authors. Um, this was a really interesting one partly because she's P.D. James is poking fun at writers and authors and that lifestyle and their different personalities, which is really funny to look, to read. And also because Adam Dalglish is not the detective on duty for this book, so usually he comes in, he's all authoritarian, and he gets down to business, and he's known for closing cases quickly and all that stuff. And But this one he kind of has to play on the sidelines a little bit, which was a fun thing to read about, a fun thing to watch happen because that's not how most of his books are. The next book I read in October was The Borrowers. I read this once when I was young but my husband had never read it and we were talking about it so I picked up a used copy. It's like perfect um, used copy. It was someone's book at some point which is neat. Um, and I, I remembered the basic plot of this, but I didn't remember a lot of um, what actually happens. It's about a family of borrowers who are a teeny tiny people that live in your home and borrow objects. Um, they don't call it stealing, they call it borrowing. Um, it had a huge influence on me when I was little, I definitely remember that. And as soon as I saw the book, I remembered a lot more about it. Um, the illustrations are really stunning, really beautiful. Um, and the book is really sweet, small, I guess it's like a middle grade um, book. Um, I would definitely suggest reading it if you haven't read it already. If you like children's books, this is a classic. I also read Coke Machine Glow by Gordon Downey in the beginning of October. This book is written by Gordon Downey, who is the lead member of the Tragically Hip, which is a rock band from Canada. I really like that band. It's very, I don't know, I think it's like old person music, but I do really like it. Um, his solo album is called Coke Machine Glow. So this is a companion book of poems uh, that goes with that album. It has the album lyrics in it as well. I might qualify Coke Machine Glow as one of my all-time favorite albums. It definitely has one of my all-time favorite songs on it. So it was interesting to read this because thinking of it more as lyrics and song lyrics and thinking of it less as poetry helped me get through this. It, well, I read it in one day. It was easy to read in that, like, it's short and quick. The poems are pretty small, most of them. Um, but it was hard to read in that, like, I'm not, I don't really read poetry. I would definitely recommend this book if you've ever heard of the band Tragically Hip. If you like Gordon Downey, he's since passed away. Good companion to the albums, good companion to Tragically Hip albums. The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat by Oliver Sacks. Oliver Sacks is best known for Awakenings, which is a book that he wrote about his neurological patients who were 
trapped in their own worlds and he gave a drug el dopa to and they emerged from those worlds for a short time the movie awakenings with robert de niro was based on this um was based on that book this book has a bunch of different stories from his neurological patients and observations over the years um, between the 1960s and 1980s of different neurological issues that his patients suffered and how they related to the world. So it's an interesting book in that he's not really, I mean, it's definitely technical and there is a lot of like technical knowledge in there and it's a little bit dry to get through those aspects. But one of the things that he's really well known for is not just looking at his patients as clinical studies or not just looking at them as the their their disabilities or their abilities, but looking at them as people and how they can lead fulfilling lives within the boundaries that are forced upon them by their neurological issues. So this was a really interesting one to read. I had picked it up before. I bought it new many, many, many years ago, probably when I first moved to New York, which was in the early 2000s. I remember going to see the movie Awakenings with one of my best friends at the time, Chris Chilvers, and he and I, I forget, we wanted to see another movie, and that, but that was the only one that was starting at the time, so we just went to see it, and it was like, we were these young kids, maybe we were like 14, 15 years old, and we were watching this movie, this like really heavy movie about um, people awakening out of almost near catatonic states, and how it's, it's like a very heavy movie it has some comedic elements but it's like a very heavy movie ultimately and a very sad movie ultimately so it was a very weird experience to go as two like young teenagers thinking we were like oh we're on our own we're going to see movies it's so fun and then we watched this like very heavy movie but I remember distinctly we went to the movie theater in Middletown which is now a Target um I love that movie theater that movie theater was in Chasing Amy. So it was in the Kevin Smith movie Chasing Amy. They have this scene in the in the movie where Ben Affleck and um, I can't remember her name. The main whoever the girl is who plays the main character Amy are f like fighting slash like falling in love in the rain and they're on this backdrop of like this weird stone wall that has long vertical breaks in it. That scene was filmed at this movie theater in Middletown where I saw Awakenings. Whatever. Very strange story. Um, but I guess that's like vlog style for you, right? Like, uh, I really like this book. It was a little bit tough to get through. It took me a little bit longer than, um, you know, a fictional book would take me. I don't read a ton of nonfiction. I like that it's break it broken up into like smaller chapters with the smaller kind of case studies. That way you, it's really more digestible and you can kind of pause after every like 20 pages or so to think about what was happening. I will say this book had very outdated language. It was, I think the last story was written in like 1986 and then this book was compiled sometime after that and it has um, kind of his notes like his after notes or postscripts on each story but the language is a little bit shocking for today's especially coming from a doctor coming from a clinical perspective like it's a little bit shocking um, but it was it was still worth reading you kind of have to like remember that it's a time and a place and I almost like substituted the correct word every time I saw the incorrect word. I would be like, oh, my brain is not going to think about that. It's going to think about this word instead. Like, you're not going to go back and edit a book like this. Why would you? You shouldn't. It's a time and a place. Like, that's what it was called even that soon, you know, ago. Like, even though that wasn't very long ago at all, they were still using like the R word and stuff, which is like, ugh. But, now we don't do that, so that's way better. So you just have to like make that mental adjustment, um, but it's worth it to read this book, I think. So if you like nonfiction, and especially if you like nonfiction to do with any kind of medical stuff, I would definitely recommend this book. Uh, okay, so first part of the month, I read four books so far. I'm listening to two audiobooks. We'll see how the rest of October goes. Actually, let me check my notes. But I think since the last time I checked, yeah, so the last book I read in October was um, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, and I've finished two books since then. I finished Agatha Christie's 
the murder at the vicarage which we listened to on um audio it was from a free audio site and it was read by richard e grant and it was so good oh my god it was so funny it was i guess technically this is like the first no okay so really this is the second agatha christie book i ever read um the first one i also read on audio and that was poirot's first one I can't remember. Maybe I'll put it down here. I don't know. But um, anyway, that one was really good, but I didn't, it wasn't as like hilarious as Murder at the Vicarage. Like Murder at the Vicarage was so funny. And partially I'm sure it was because Richard E. Grant, who's an actor and a voice actor, was reading it. He did all the voices and he just got all the cadence and like got all the funny parts and got all the like comedic timing so perfect and it was just so silly and funny and awesome um so I really really enjoyed that one I definitely I hope I wish that that free audio book site had more Agatha Christie because I would love to listen to some more of her books Murder at the Vicarage obviously it's about a murder at the Vicarage. It happens to be the Miss Marple, the first book in the Miss Marple series, um, which I thought was really interesting because Miss Marple wasn't in the book as much as I thought she was going to be. I mean, she is in it, but like it's told from the vicar's perspective and he's the narrator. So she just kind of comes in and out of the story instead of like watching the BBC series where she is like the main focus and she, you know, she's always around. Um, so I love Murder at the Vicarage. That was amazing. I read that in October. And then the next book I read in October was The House of Silk by Anthony Horowitz. Anthony Horowitz, I guess, is a British uh, mystery writer in general. And then he also uh, wrote a couple of Sherlock Holmes books. And they were the first officially sanctioned Sherlock Holmes books by the Arthur Conan Doyle estate. And I can see why. I mean, he, he writes very similarly to Arthur Conan Doyle. Like, you can tell he's emulating his style, which is really 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 cool I have a lot more thoughts on this book I did enjoy it um and I definitely plan to read his other Holmes books and I also definitely plan to read some other mystery novels that Anthony Horowitz wrote but I'm not going to go into it too much because I think I'm going to do a dedicated review to this one I don't know we'll see if that one comes out before this October wrap-up or what but I'm um, just popping in here with a little update on my October reading and I'll see you probably in a few days or weeks it is October 30th. It is Friday afternoon. I wanted to talk about two books that I've read between uh, now and the last time that we spoke. Through a Glass Darkly, uh, which was written by Helen McCloy. Never heard of this. I picked this up at a book sale or something. I'm not sure where. I had never heard of it before. Um, apparently she was a writer in the 40s. She died in 1994. It was awesome. Um, it was the eighth book in the series, so I definitely want to pick out some of the other series. I had never read this author, I'd never heard of her, and I think her style was really good. A little bit noirish, a little bit Agatha Christie, a little bit, like, early, I mean, like, 1940s, like, murder mysteries. They're the greatest. Like, how can you go wrong? They're probably one of my favorite genres. So, um... This was interesting because the synopsis doesn't really give it away and it was had a lot more like supernatural elements than I thought it would and you having never read this author before I didn't know where it was going to take me and it was really a surprise and I wasn't sure what was going to happen. It took place in a boarding school, a female boarding school in upstate New York or maybe Massachusetts, but um, one of the teachers is, happens to be Dr. Basil Willing's girlfriend, and so she calls him in to investigate when strange things start happening at this all-girls boarding school. If you like mysteries, if you like Agatha Christie, if you like noir, if you like short books, which you know I do, um, this is a really good one. The next book that I read so far in October is The Old Country by Mordecai Gerstein. Uh, it's a children's book. I would say it's like middle grade bordering on young adult because the themes in it are a little bit more adult than a, a middle grade book. I have really mixed thoughts on this book. I didn't like it very much. It was all about war. It's about like a young girl who is from the old country and she is um, she is magically transported into the body of a fox 
and she is telling her story as an old woman to her granddaughter. So that part was interesting. This war that's being fought is kind of taking over the country and her family has to flee and she is one of the you know, lesser of the population of this old country. And so everyone's against him. There's a war between two sides of the old country, but everyone's against her people. Um, and one, it was about war. I don't like books about war. It's a shame because obviously there's things to be learned. And this was certainly a book with like a message, but also like it was a book with a message and it like beat you over the head with it. And I was just like, not that into it. I think the writing was really disjointed. Like sometimes it felt really um, like a children's book. Sometimes it read more like an adult book. Sometimes it read like you, they were talking down to kids. Sometimes it read like it was supposed to be a very simplistic fairy tale. I just, I didn't find the flow very good. That being said, I did enjoy some of the characters and I did like the overall kind of imagery that was conjured. You know, it had a lot of uh, commentary on war, but it also had a lot of commentary on like wildness and freedom and being who you are and um, how we judge beings that are not like us. So that was interesting. But overall, I'm not like a huge fan of this book. Somebody would love this book. It's very fairy tale esque It's very fable-esque. I'm just not that into that. I don't know if I'm going to get to any more books. I probably will not finish any more books. Although I do have an audio book that I want to want to listen to and it's only a couple of hours so maybe I'll get to that who knows but if I read any more books in October I will pop in and talk about them okay so those were the books that I read in October hope you like this reading wrap-up vlog style if you do like this vlog style let me know in the comments um, if you would prefer a vlog style like this for November or if you would prefer like a more straight up just here are the books that I read. So yeah, happy November, everybody. Bye. So far in, oh fuck. Neuro, neurologic, neuro, neurological, is November 30th. It is Friday, no it's not. It is October 30th.